The following lecture on Pilgrim's Progress deals with Christian and Hopeful at the Delectable Mountains. So I begin the Sunday School class by introducing them to the book Samuel Pike and Samuel Hayward's Cases of Conscience, the 1859 edition, and lament that experimental religion, even by 1859, did not enjoy the popularity it had just 100 years ago. So I start with the book, Cases of Conscience, Pike and Hayward, and then begin the study of the Delectable Mountains. The second thing I wanted to show you is, um, I'm always looking around to see if uh, this book is ever put in digital Kindle format, and it hasn't been. I've showed you this book a number of times, but for some reason, it was uh, on sale. This is the 1859 edition larger print. It was on sale for $4, postage paid free, Amazon Prime, which I couldn't turn down. And I'll probably get into this book more next week when we discuss Little Faith. But what struck me as I was looking at this book, now this book first came out in the year 1755. There were numerous editions, 1808, we probably had one, 1828, and this here is the 1859 edition. It never got reprinted again until 1967, and the uh, Presbyterian Church did volume one of this. And so I'm reading the introduction, and it says, It has been supposed that the class of subjects discussed in the following pages excite little interest in the church now than they did. Preeminently a bookmaking age, 1859, it is not in keeping with the spirit of the times to publish works on experimental religion. Which is interesting to me because I'm familiar with some of the things that were going on in 1859. You had the great revival in New York City, which spread to England. They started praying for it, that God would do for England what happened in New York City which spread to Ireland, which has effects in that country to this day. Richard Owen Roberts Publishing published six volumes of revival works. One of them that I've, and I've narrated parts of all six of them, but one of them that is really interesting to me, I quoted from when I was doing an overview of the life of Asa Held Nettleton, called Authentic Records of Revival, now in progress in the United Kingdom, 1859, William Reed. It's an amazing account of some of the things that were happening in Ireland. And some of that experimental religion, as you would call it in those days, those revivals, still you can see the marks of in Ireland to this day. And so for them to say that experimental theology was on a wane, it wasn't interesting. I said, if that's the case in 1859, when the writers like John Angel James was writing Christian Progress, and some of your finest works were in the first part of the 19th century, where does that leave us? So with that, I'll start today's lesson, lesson The Fellowship of the Hospitable Shepherds. The delectable mountains, let's substitute the word beautiful, delightful for delectable, and you get the idea. The delectable mountains were first mentioned and viewed from a distance from Palace Beautiful. Now the commentators say the pilgrims, plural, first saw it at Palace Beautiful, but that can't be correct because only Christians saw it. In fact, even faithful before he was martyred didn't visit Palace Beautiful. And hopeful and Christian became friends out of Vanity Fair, but I was surprised a couple of commentators said that, but they was seen at a distance from the palace, beautiful, but now they are in its vicinity. They went forward until they came to the delectable mountains which belonged to the Lord of that hill about which we have spoken before. Thus they drew near to the mountains so as to look more closely at the gardens, the orchards, the vineyards and the fountains of water where they also drank and washed themselves and freely ate of the fruit of the vine. Now on the tops of these mountains there were shepherds feeding their flocks and standing alongside of the highway. So here were gardens, orchards, 
vineyards and fountains. It is a garden of the Lord for rest. What a kind mercy to Christian, to hopeful after going through such a difficult trial in the castle of giant despair to come upon this place, an orchard of the Lord for spiritual food, a vineyard of the Lord for new wine, and a fountain of the Lord for cleansing and the satisfaction of thirst. In this place, the two pilgrims were able to recover and be refreshed in their journey. They have become weary through their trials at Downing Castle and on account of the climb up the mountains. Leaning heavily on their staves, they cry out with exhaustion, Restore to us the joy of our salvation, Psalm 51, 12. So the shepherds interrogate them. I'll tell you why in a minute. So they're asked a variety of questions. Therefore, the pilgrims approach them, and as is customary when such travelers are weary and pause to talk, they leaned on their staves or staves and inquired, To whom do these delectable mountains belong? And who owns the sheep that are feeding here? The shepherd said, These mountains are Emmanuel's land, and they are within the sight of his city. The sheep also are his, and he laid down his life for them. Excuse me, I was looking for my pointer. So I wanted to talk to you about a poem that kind of sums up what they were going through. Christian, is this the way to the celestial city? You're going in the right direction. How much further do we have to go? It is too far for any except those who shall certainly arrive there. They don't answer the question directly. It reminds me of Luke 13, 24. Are there few that be saved? Your business is to strive to enter it at the straight gate. Is a way ahead safe or dangerous? It is safe for those to whom it is to be safe, and so on. So this poem is originally titled Last Words by Anna Ross Cousin, 1824 to 1906. And you've heard this poem before and yet you haven't listened to these words. I've wrestled on towards heaven against storm and wind and tide. Now like a weary traveler that leaneth on his guide, amid the shades of evening while sinks life's lingering sand, I held the glory dawning from Emmanuel's land. Deep waters crossed life's pathway, the hedge of thorns was sharp. Now these lie all behind me, O oh well, O oh for a well-tuned harp. O oh, to join Alleluia with yon triumphant band, who sing where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. With mercy and with judgment my web of time he wove, and I the dews of sorrow were lustered with his love. I'll bless the land that guided, I'll bless the heart that planned, when thrown where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Soon shall the cup of glory wash down earth's bitterest woes. Soon shall the desert briar break into Eden's rose. The curse shall change to blessing, the name on earth that's banned. Be graven on the white stone in Emmanuel's land. Does anybody recognize that hymn? Pastor Merrick? Yeah, this is the sands of timer sinking, but we have five verses in our hymnal. The original hymn had 19 verses and was based on 37. I counted them up myself. I was looking at the reference of Samuel Rutherford's letters. That's why he's pictured here as well. But this, do you remember the phrase, it were a well spent journey? Those seven deaths lay between. It is fun to look through Rutherford's letters and see what he wrote because if your love for the Lord Jesus Christ is waning, this is so powerful. But this is what Rutherford wrote. Oh, to be feasted for eternity with the fatness, sweetness, dainties of the rays and beams of matchless glory, an incomparable fountain love. It were a well-spent journey to creep hands and feet through seven deaths and seven hells to enjoy him up at the wellhead. Only let us not be weary. The miles to that land are fewer and shorter than when we first believed. Strangers are not wise to quarrel with their host and complain of their lodging. It is a foul way, but a fair home. 1646. 
So whose sheep are those being fed? They also belong to Emmanuel since he redeemed them with the offering of his own life. John 10, 11. Clearly this is not the territory of hirelings. John 10, 12. Second question, is this the way to the celestial city? Yes, though narrow and precipitous, this is the right way. The forward vision will eliminate any doubt. Well, how far ahead is the celestial city? The answer they receive is unexpected, but serves to direct the pilgrim's focus from responsible perseverance to God's sovereign decree. Both aspects are true, but here the indication is that Responsible perseverance is ultimately based upon God's sovereign decree, John 6, 37. For God's elect, the celestial city is not too far ahead. For others, it is impossibly distant. Hence, presumption is challenged. Sovereign grace is upheld. And for the assured pilgrim, there is hope even in weakness. But is the way ahead safe or dangerous? This is the first time I've actually quoted A.W. Pink in this study, which is kind of surprising because I've even taught on him. I'm very familiar with his writings, but this is so appropriate for this spot. His warning about Hebrews 10.26, But are genuine Christians in any such danger of what? Apostasy. Looked at from the standpoint of God's everlasting covenant, which he made with them in the person of their sponsor, which covenant is ordered in all things and sure? No, no, they're not in danger. Looked at according to their standing and state in Christ as those who have been perfected forever, Hebrews 10, 14. No, they're not in danger. But considered as they are in themselves, mutable creatures, as was unfallen Adam, without any strength of their own, yes. Viewed as those who still have the sinful nature within them, yes. Contemplated as those who are yet the objects of Satan's relentless attacks, yes. But it may be said, God sees his people only in Christ. Listen to this distinction. Not so, is a reply. Were that the case, he would never chasten them, Hebrews 5 to 10, 12, 5 to 10. God views the Christian both in Christ legally and in this world actually. He addresses us as responsible beings, 2 Peter 1, 10, and regulates the manifestations of his love for us according to our conduct, John 14, 23. An exposition of Hebrews. Do you know that none of A.W. Pink's works were ever copyrighted? They were always in the public domain. And that's why you can get these uh, so cheap for the Kindle and so on. Everything after the year 1922 is taken from his magazine, Studies in the Scriptures, but it was never copyrighted. So if you have an Amazon Kindle, you can get this commentary on Hebrews for a dollar, 99 cents which I first bought in 1981 in hardback. So as Christian recalls his former refreshing lodging at the Palace Beautiful, he now longs for a repeat experience on account of his present feeling of near exhaustion. However, the shepherds have been careful to anticipate the needs of strangers such as these, Hebrews 13, 1 and 2. So they respond with cautious investigation. Shepherds, the Lord of these mountains has given us orders that we should not neglect the provision of hospitalities for strangers. Therefore, the refreshing and good features of this place are at your disposal. I also saw in my dreams that when the shepherds recognized that they were wayfaring men, travelers, they put some questions to them which were answered as in other places. For example, from where have you come and how did you enter the way? And what means have you used to persevere thus far? For they understood the few pilgrims who first set out and travel a distance, yet show their face at these mountains. And I think of that statement and then question again, is this really meant to be a picture of the church? Could you imagine as a church, strangers coming in amongst us, and we're surprised if they're here because very few people make it that far. But there's something more 
that strikes me as I meditate on those words, and uh, I'm just going to state the historical facts. This isn't a commentary on the Puritans and John Bunyan and so on, but it is surprising that he said very few pilgrims who set out travel this distance and show their face in these mountains. But when the shepherds heard their answers and were pleased with them, they looked upon them very lovingly and said, Welcome to the delectable mountains. Now the shepherds, whose names were knowledge, experience, watchful, and sincere, took them by the hand and conducted them to their tents where they partook of a prepared feast. Moreover, they said, We would like you to stay here for a while and become acquainted with us. Though even more, we recommend that you comfort yourselves with the good health that these delectable mountains provide. The pilgrims indicated that they would be happy to stay, and so they retired to a restful sleep because it was now very late. So again we see the care with which a 17th century separatist church, these are the notes of Barry Horn, Receive members into its fellowship. The concern here is not so much comprehensive knowledge as evident genuine conversion. And the pilgrims are questioned about their journey. Like the damsels at the palace, beautiful, the shepherds carefully investigate these travelers since few that are authentic reach this distance. I remember it was 19... Um, 84, 1985, and I was living in New York City. There was no internet yet. The personal computer had just been invented four years before, 1981. And uh, I was aware of, I was under awakening. I had no assurance of salvation. And so I would uh, journey up to the New York Public Library because I was interested in this whole idea that the Puritans believe some of them, some of them, this isn't universal, I don't want to make blanket statements, but some of them believe that there were few that are saved, and I don't know but that they took that to an extreme. So, back in the day, the works of Thomas Shepard weren't in print. He was one of the early New England Puritans, but I wanted to look up his books that I knew they would have a copy of in the New York Public Library. Few of them that begin to come here, the shepherd said, show their face on these mountains. And Thomas Shepherd says in The Sincere Convert. And just the sentence that I got from the card catalog in those days was almost overwhelming for me because I went through these waters so deep that those that are saved are very few, and that those that are saved are saved with very much difficulty. Quote, Nay, even amongst them that have the means of grace, but few shall be saved. It may be sometimes amongst ninety-nine in a parish. Christ sends a minister to call someone lost sheep among them. Three grounds were had where the seed was sown, and only one Good. It is a strange speech of Chrysostom in his fourth sermon to the people of Antioch, where he was much beloved and did much good. How many do you think, saith he, shall be saved in this city? It will be a hard speech to you, but I will speak it, though here be so many thousands of you, yet there cannot be found a hundred that shall be saved, and I doubt of them too, for what villainy is there amongst youths? What sloth and old men, and, and he goes on. Well, I've told you in the past, I'm a moderator on Facebook of a reform study of church history. So I actually tried to catalog some of this, which I can't go into right now. But in the 19th century, certainly Spurgeon believed that it's going to be a great number. And his emphasis on that number, which no man can number, and Dabney and so on. So I don't have a conclusion on this. I just, for my own sake, and without placing myself back in a spirit of bondage and fear, I think it's safest to assume that the words of Jesus are my guide, and that is, you strive to enter into the straight gate. And once you're through the gate, it doesn't stop there. You keep on that narrow way. 
But anyway, a plurality of eldership is suggested in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and collectively they represent those spiritual qualities which an individual elder ought to possess. Four things. By the shepherd, knowledge. He is mighty in his understanding of the word of God and thus able to teach. 1 Timothy 3, 2. By the shepherd, experience in not being a new convert, 1 Timothy 3, 6. He is mature in Christian living. And thus, a better able to display this truth model. And by the shepherd, watchful. He jealously guards against wolves, apostates, Satan's angels closed in false light, snares, and so on. And Paul warned the people continually about them, and he yearned for them. He says, I travel and birth at Christ be, till Christ be formed in you. And by the shepherd sincere with single-mindedness and purity of purpose, he stimulates trust in the flock as they follow First Peter 5, 2. The pilgrims are offered pastoral hospitality, this particular commentator says that this is the local church that's identified. I just, um, I can't be dogmatic at that point because there are things that you wouldn't say to travelers if they came into your local church. But further, there's no mention of an assembly. It's just sheep on the side of a hill, which is the Lord's elect. So I can't say like so many others, that this is in fact meant to represent the church. The hill called error. So you have four shepherds, and each of them before Christian and hopeful go on their way, show them, I don't know if you'd call it a vision, something to warn them. So first it's a hill called error, Then I saw in my dream that in the morning the shepherds invited Christian and hopeful to walk with them upon the mountains. So they joined them and were escorted for a while with a pleasant view on every side. Then the shepherds said to one another, Shall we show these pilgrims some of the wonders that are to be seen here? So upon agreeing that they should do this, the guests were first taken to the top of a hill called Error, which was very steep on the furthest side. There they were told to look down to the bottom, so Christian and Hopeful peered down, and there at the bottom they saw several men all dashed to pieces, having fallen from the top. Then said Christian, What does this mean? The shepherds answered, What you have you not heard of those who were led into air through the listening to Hymenaeus and Philetus with regard to the doctrine of the resurrection of the body? They answered, Yes. Then the shepherds replied, Those who you see lying dashed to pieces at the bottom of the mountain, are they, and to this day they have remained unburied, as you can see, being an example to others to take care, lest they clamor too high, or come too near the brink of this mountain. So the rest of faith well disposes the pilgrims to the reception of this necessary instruction. And sometimes as I'm studying these, and I've gone through so many commentaries and listened to so many Sunday schools, and yet something just strikes me in my own study of it. And I see in these four visions, these four illustrations, the four types of soils that are in the parable of the sower, because the seed that fell by the wayside was the most superficial. They're not even doctrinally grounded and of course then you have the seed that fell into the stony ground and they receive the doctrine with joy but in a time of temptation fall away and then you see in the soil that fell among the thorns that the profession of these people may be maintained to the end of their journey There may be a plant that is visible, but it never brings forth fruit to perfection. And that's what struck me as I was looking at uh, each of these pictures. The hill air has a dangerous or precipitous steep side. On top of this hill is a dangerous precipice. Even sound Bible doctrine has a line that if you cross it, truth becomes damning error. 
Hence those enjoying pure fellowship in these holy heights are yet susceptible to air spawned within the assembly of God's people. And should they fall over the edge, their fall is both swift and irrecoverable. It reminds me I was sitting in the library at Calvin Seminary. It's an incredible library. And this is before they had republished the Banner of Truth. They republished volumes 1 to 16, which started in the year 1955. And Ian Murray was only 24 years old at the time. And the warning and why they started this magazine was so edifying. And I remember reading these Puritan quotes, which at the time hadn't really been republished. And they quoted this old Puritan, they said, who said, if you want to perish quickly, throw yourself into the stream of corrupt doctrine, and you are not like to be very long in going there. And so I looked it up and discovered it was William Gurnall and the Christian in Complete Armor. We have ways of looking for references that you just didn't have back in the day. And that's what's being emphasized here. Their fall is both swift and irrecoverable. Deceived pilgrims are dashed below. One fatal misstep results in the complete dismemberment of the former church adherent. Error does have its logical consequences. To deny the truthfulness of Scripture leads to a thousand result, resultant infidelities. Number two, deceived pilgrims are left exposed. The shepherds are careful to leave these remains for the sober viewing of passing pilgrims. Residency in a local church is not a guarantee against misadventure. But residency in a local church ought to include plain warning concerning the subtle invasion of error. Paul constantly warns local churches of insidious and cancerous error that invades authentic fellowships. The heel error has some puzzled observers. Using a familiar biblical expression, what means this? This is the language of Christian, if you'll remember, when he was in the house of interpreter. What does this mean? The pilgrims expressed perplexity at the tragedy of the valley below as they looked down from the heights of fellowship above. So the explanation that soberly warns in conformity with the pastoral epistles of Paul, John Bunyan places considerable stress on negative warning concerning false doctrine that emanates from false teachers. So the shepherd's minister, as Bunyan learned to minister from his mentor, John Gifford. You know, I really haven't mentioned his pastor, the person that Bunyan was put in contact with when he first became awakened and he was listening at a distance from some of some ladies talking about the new birth and he said whatever that is I haven't experienced it but I'm so intrigued and they brought him to see his pastor uh, um, their pastor John Gifford what's interesting about that from what I can tell Bunyan was only under John Gifford's ministry for two years and Gifford passed away not long after this Bunyan was jailed and it's, uh, interestingly enough, while he was in jail and before he got out, he was actually voted to be the successor, the new pastor of this church. Next, the resurrection heir of Hymenaeus and Philetus. These heretics teaching that was labeled spiritual gangrene and culminated in spiritual death. They perverted biblical Christianity at its roots by denying the future substantial and bodily resurrection of the dead, 2 Timothy 2, verses 16 to 18. William Hendrickson aptly comments, They resemble those present-day liberals who, while refusing to be caught saying there is no resurrection, still they allegorize the concept, leading people astray. So next... Having been warned of this, they come to a mountain called Caution. Then I saw that the shepherds took them to the top of another mountain named Caution and directed them to look some distance away. Having done this, the pilgrims thought that they could discern several men walking up and down among a number of tombs. 
And they noticed that the men were blind because they sometimes stumbled over these tombs and were unable to find their way out from among them. Then said Christian, what does this mean? So the shepherds answered, did you not notice a little below these mountains a style? A style. So we're coming back to the style. A style that led into a meadow on the left-hand side of this way? They answered yes. Then said the shepherds, from that style there goes a path that leads directly to Doubting Castle, which is owned by Giant Despair. Could you imagine what's going on inside of them, having just gotten out of this castle? And these men, pointing to those wandering among the tombs, were once on pilgrimage, even as you now are, that is, until they came to that same style. And because the right way was rough on their feet in that place, they chose to leave the way and cross over to the meadow, and there they were taken captive by giant despair and cast into Doubting Castle. Now, after they had been kept in a dungeon for a while, the giant eventually put out their eyes and led them to the tombs. There he has left them to wander to this very day. So that was the thing that Giant Despair wanted to show Christian. And hopeful as well, his wife, Diffident, says, show them the bodies of those that you have slain or punished before them and see if we can get them to relent. He who wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain, remain in the congregation of the dead. Then Christian and Hopeful looked at one another while tears streamed down their faces, yet they said nothing to the shepherds. Inside was both contrition and acknowledgement of the mercy for having been delivered from there. But why would I say that this reminded me of the ground, the stony ground that the seed fell among, and that is because... Um, of the case of um, the pilgrim that had went before Christian and Hopeful who had perished he had been on the way for a while he had gotten on the road for a while so he didn't fall away at once he turned aside unto his crooked way and the Lord led him forth with the workers of iniquity. But here is a further example of how Bunyan considers continually in his allegory, continuity in his allegory to be of great importance. Added light is now given concerning the fearful problem of despair and suicide. And I'm not going to go into that. The somber valley of stumbling blind men. Taken to another mountain named Caution, the pilgrims are directed to look backward and downward. Before them is a most chilling scene. Men blindly stumble and fall amongst tombs, gashing themselves, being unable to rescue themselves. John Bunyan obviously felt that pastoral instruction should be serious and convicting as well as joyous and restful. So what do we know about those that were at the bottom of this mountain? They're living amongst the dead. They're blind amongst the dead. They're as aimless corpses. They appear to have had their eyes plucked out. Their capacity to see now appears to be utterly hopeless. And so there's a terrifying interpretation of the informed shepherds. While the heel error had touched a gruesome chord of warning in general, the degree of personal conviction is now greatly heightened to a point where the souls of these pilgrims are felt with intense pain. Filled with intense pain, they writhe, they cringe, they are so affected by it. The Lord of the Hill has a grave lesson for those who have recently escaped from captivity, born of disobedience. There is a nearby stile leading to Doubting Castle. But how embarrassing it now is that the shepherds should ask the pilgrims whether they could remember seeing this detour. Their affirmative response must surely have been timid, Probably guilt caused their eyes to turn away. But we learn that giant despair imprisons his pilgrims there. They know this fact to be all too true, but shame seals their lips. Now they recall the grisly remains they had been forced to witness in the castle yard. The alternative to the rough way, though apparently smooth, had turned into the most treacherous of ways. Secondly, giant despair blinds pilgrims there. 
here is a further confirmation that this bully in Finn yet cannot directly put pilgrims to death, but rather he brings pressure to bear so that his captives might self-destruct. Now did Christian and Hopeful begin to adore that sovereign grace which preserved them from this irremediable condition, First Timothy 1, verses 15 to 17. And finally, Giant Despair buries pilgrims there. He can so blind his captives that they are permanently separated from the promises of God. As a result, they eventually commit suicide, become represented by a tombstone, and then are succeeded by more foolish pilgrims. Bunyan had a sermon called Israel's Hope and Courage where he says, Some retain the name of Christ and the notion of him as a savior, but cast them off in the very things in which the essential parts of his sacrifice, merits, and priesthood consist. And this lies the mystery of their iniquity. They dare not altogether deny that Christ does save his people as a priest, but then their art is to confound his offices until they jostle out of doors the merit of his blood and the perfection of his justifying righteousness. Such draw away the people from the cross, put out their eyes, and lead them among the infidels. I had quoted you a paragraph a couple of weeks back of uh, Joseph Elaine, An Alarm to the Unconverted, where he said that the unsound part with Christ by halves are all for Christ as the Savior. They do not want him as the king. And this is the kind of thing that Bunyan is alluding to in that sermon. So there is a warning from the word of the Lord. In quoting Proverbs 21.16, Bunyan draws upon his own experience described in grace abounding. I'll read just a part of that. By the strange and unusual assaults of the tempter was my soul like a broken vessel, driven as with the winds and tossed headlong into despair, sometimes upon the covenant of works and sometimes the wish that the new covenant And the conditions of it might so far forth as I thought myself concerned be turned another way and changed. But in all these I was but as those that jostle against the rocks, more broken, scattered, and rent. Oh, the unthought of imaginations, frights, fears, and terrors that are affected by a thorough application of guilt yielded to desperation. It's interesting that it took so long for Bunyan to have a settled assurance of salvation. In fact, when he first started preaching, and it was obvious that God was owning his preaching, and so much so that when I talked about the friendship between him and John Owen, John Owen invited John Bunyan before he was in prison to his church to preach and yet he has this interesting statement that I preach as a man in chain chains to men in chains and though I hear my own fetters rattle that's an indication he wasn't enjoying that peace that assurance that he would get later on that the remedy is still the same there's still hope for you run to Christ and you see so much of this in his autobiography But the result of what the pilgrims saw was a silent conviction of the tearful pilgrims. While the shepherds may have thought the weeping visitors to be full of concern for the desolate reprobates amongst the tombs, in other words, they felt sorry for those who had perished or were perishing below, yet they did not at all grasp the concealed horror of this situation. The gaunt and pallid expressions of Christian and hopeful accompanied with bodily tremors shrouded the inner silent chorus of there but for the grace of God go we. 1 Corinthians 15.10 Now did they more fully realize to what degree they were the objects of sovereign distinguishing grace. So I'll just give you a little application of that. Vision, when Israel murmured about the harshness of the way in the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula, God gave his people the desires of their heart, which turned out to be both loathsome and productive of a plague. Numbers 11, verses 1 to 34, Psalm 106, 13 to 15. So the Christian in this present earthly wilderness pilgrimage is to endure God's set course rather than seek a smoother passage, by path metal, which in fact leads to destruction, Matthew seven thirteen to 14. Therefore, pilgrims are to walk cautiously, circumspectly, 
even if sorely, sorely, and avoid the delusion of seeming fairer avenues. This way is going to be easier. I want to go this way. That actually result in captivity and despair. Second Timothy six three to ten. So the fourth, third vision, the byway to hell. Then I saw in my dream that the shepherds took them to another place located in a valley where there was a door in the side of a hill. So they opened the door and invited the pilgrims to look in. Therefore, on looking inside, they saw that it was very dark and smoky. They also thought that they heard there a rumbling sound like a fire as well as the crying of some tormented souls. And in addition, they smelt the stench of brimstone. Then Christian said, what does this mean? The shepherds told him in reply, This is a byway to hell where hypocrites are able to enter. That is, those like Esau who would sell his birthright, or Judas who would sell his master, or like Alexander who would blaspheme the gospel, or like Ananias and Sapphira who would lie and dissemble. Hopeful says, I notice that every one of these at one time or another put on a display of going on pilgrimage, even as we are now doing. Is that not true? So again, it makes me wonder if this is somewhat of a picture of the parable of the soils, and this is the thorny ground here, because these professors, some of them, in the case of Judas, to the end of his life, and maintain a Christian profession and they may fool the people around them. The shepherd says yes and they traveled for quite a great distance as well. Hopeful. Exactly how far is it possible for pilgrims such as these to travel in their day? That is while appreciating the fact that they were miserably cast aside. And the shepherd said some can go even further than this while others don't even reach these Mountains. Then the pilgrims spoke to each other, We certainly have a need to cry to the strong one for strength. Oh, that, that affected us more. We have need to cry to God for strength. And then the shepherd says, Yes, and you will need to use it when it is given for you, to you. And we got to get that view of Perseverance, not in a cringing, cowering fear, but to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And if you have the works of Jonathan Edwards, I really, really recommend the sermon, the manner in which salvation is to be obtained, taken from Noah building the ark, because he had to persevere in it against all of the opposition. And it didn't stop when he was safe when he was pronounced as finding favor in the eyes of God. It continued on. So in a valley against an unnamed hill, the pilgrims have their attention directed toward a formidable door that is yet open to them by the shepherds. Evidently, Bunyan believed that pastoral exhortation for the saints ought to include warnings about the doctrine of hell. Why? Because true children of God will only all the more gird up the loins of their minds and keep sober, First Peter 1, verse 13. While, as we shall soon see, apostates will be suitably warned, Jude 4, 10 to 13. So there is a hillside door that is open for inspection. There is the appearance of darkness. The entrance view is only of the periphery of hell rather than its searing core. Hence the blackness of darkness, Jude 13, dominates apart from the reddish tinge of scorching smoke. There is a sound of torment. Rumbling flame cannot drown out the piercing cries of the damned in their endless and hopeless torment, Luke 16, 22 to 26. And there is a smell of brimstone. The chilling interpretation of the byway to hell. I'm just going to read this paragraph and get quickly on to the last vision. Christian and hopeful are probably not entirely ignorant of the identification of this place. What really disturbs them is the background of its inhabitants and particularly the reasons for their incarceration. The shepherds are well able and consider it necessary to identify and expose the marks of those hypocrites and apostates who have now entered into their reward. There's Esau the mercenary, he went this way. Judas the betrayer went this way. Alexander, 
the blasphemer went this way. He strenuously opposed both the Apostle Paul and his gospel message. Ananias and Sapphira, that's Acts 5, the deceivers went this way. And a perplexing lesson of the endurance of apostates, the pilgrims meditate that all of these inhabitants of hell had come this far and had evidenced considerable endurance. What was their experience? What was these Christians' experience in the Valley of Humiliation? How did they react to Vanity Fair and so on? They persevered for a great distance. So it's a stimulus to prayer for strength. The pilgrims reason that if some apostates can so advance through natural ability and yet be lost, and to actually enter the celestial city, they will need the distinguishing power of God, 1 Peter 1, 3-5. So I had a quote by Owen as a warning, and I just simply don't have time to read it. But because uh, I want to get to the last vision, there's an awful lot here. The telescopic view from the hill clear. By this time, the pilgrims had a desire to press forward, and the shepherds agreed that they should do this. So they all walked together toward the end of the mountains, and the shepherds said to one another, Let us show the pilgrims here a view of the gates of the celestial city, provided they have the skill to look through our perspective glass. I call it a glass, a telescope. I was kind of interested in that. I mean, what kind of telescopes did you have in the 17th century? And uh, what I could find online is one of these belonged to Galileo, another one belonged to Isaac Newton, but they both would have been around when Bunyan uses this analogy, this picture. So the pilgrims gratefully accepted the invitation, hence they were led to the top of a hill called Clear and given the shepherds telescope to look through. Then they attempted to look ahead, but the remembrance of the previous sight, their hands are still shaken because of the vision that they had just seen. They're not able to look through the telescope clearly. They're so trembling inside. But they do look. And they are amazed at what they see. Yet they thought they saw something like the gate and some of the glory of the place. And they went on their way and they sang. So some commentators criticize Bunyan for portraying the shepherds as offering unpalatable fare at the delectable mountains. I mean, these pilgrims need rest. They need refreshment. And three of the four of these visions are very disconcerting. But it is keeping with the parable of the sower because some seed fell into good ground and they're persevering in the way and they get a vision that shows them that is not all in vain. So the shepherds offer a view of the celestial city. While the pilgrims are eager to press forward, yet their pastoral counselors agree to give them added incentive, namely an enticing view of heaven. Bunyan strongly believes that Christian perseverance is linked to, as Peter puts it, an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, 1 Peter 1, 4. John describes a heavenly goal as that time when we shall be like him, Christ, because we shall see him just as he is, 1 John 3, 2. The pilgrims are led to the top of the hill clear. And a telescope shakes. They can't hold it steadily through fear of the past. Here is another of Bunyan's wry situations, which frames a sober and penitent response with a hint of caricature. The pilgrim's trembling hands cannot hold the telescope steadily because of the recent affecting encounter they had with the byway to hell. Perhaps a preceding vista from the mountain caution also added to their tremors. But at least they see a blurred image of heaven's glory. While conflict amongst saints as a, a, in a local church can cloud their vision of future glory, here the disturbance concerns conflict within their own hearts, the, in, the hearts of the individual pilgrims. At even the very best of times, the Christian has limited vision. However, resurrected guilt, indwelling sin, and even the contemplation of the fiendish terrors of hell condemn a believer's clear vision of his perspective heavenly home, looked at from God's vantage point in the covenant of grace they were never in any danger 
But as a means to that end of their perseverance, there are warnings and there are exhortations to persevere. But they sing the praises because they know that they are headed that way. So there's a parting exhortation to them as they're leaving. What, When they were about to depart, one of the shepherds gives them a note, written instructions describing the way of head. That's knowledge, and I believe knowledge shows them the first vision. Another of them advised the pilgrims to beware of the flatterer. And that's experience, and experience gave him them the second vision and also this exhortation. The third told them to take care that they did not sleep on the enchanted ground. And the fourth of them, sincerity, commended them to God's sustaining mercy as they traveled. So Bunyan said he awoke from his dream. Each shepherd gives his own piece of farewell counsel. However, as an enticement with little difficulty attached, Bunyan leaves it up to the reader to decide which shepherd provides which item of assistance. The pilgrims are about to venture forth into the world once again, and they will still need every means of grace to persevere in their journey. It is a vital part of faithful local church ministry to provide such spiritual sustenance. Um, I mentioned Alexander White's characters in Pilgrim's Progress, and he has a separate sermon on each of the four shepherds. And if you ever get a chance, it's very edifying to read that. But um, I look forward to next week because I think that there's going to be some things that are very, very helpful in that regard. They come across ignorance. But secondly, they come across little faith. And I want to develop that. Uh, Why is it that some Christians just seem to not have a settled assurance of salvation? And I want to answer some of those questions next week. And then the third character is turn away. I haven't yet studied that, but I, I look forward to opening up this think about little faith because I want something to be helpful for those that struggle with this. Alright, we do have these warnings, we have these exhortations, but in order to persevere you have to have hope. Romans 5.5 5. The love of God shed abroad in your heart. An awareness of that spirit of adoption, the rivers of living water flowing out of you. That hunger and thirst after righteousness. That vision out before you of where you're going. Sure, there are things that are warnings along the way, but in order to fight, we have to know whose side we're on. We have to draw strength from this God as a father, not as a judge. And so I hope I can open that up for you. I'm sorry I wasn't able to leave room for discussions. I knew there was a lot here. So with that, I'll close the lesson. Father, I pray that you could own some of what I said today through the business of my week and not having the time to prepare, leaning more upon other people's notes than I would have liked too. Still, I hope there was something that was useful in this, and we pray that you would be with us and go with us through the rest of our worship time. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.